Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And uh, we're going to continue looking at Daniel chapter 11, but we're going to go do a diversion to a couple of other things first. Um, but before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? The dear, gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this morning and that we can meet together once again uh, for the last study, morning study of this week. And uh, we pray, Lord, for your spirit's presence, that you can teach us, and give us wisdom and understanding. And thank you for all the things that you do in our lives. We ask for your care um, in all that we come in contact with. And uh, I pray for uh, the people around us that are in need and for your angels' guidance to those that are in need. Help us to be ministers in this earth. And thank you for hearing our prayer and be with us in this study. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning again, everyone. Yeah, I was just, um, normally what I do uh, in the mornings after the study is I breakfast and then I go, uh, I walk five kilometers, three miles. Uh, and I go to the pool and I swim lengths for an hour and then I walk back. And yesterday I didn't, uh, um, I decided not to go swimming, but I, I still went to the rec center. I walked there and I went a different way than I normally do. And as I was walking, there's this place around the, the reservoir and there was a guy in the ditch, um, in the snow. So we'd had a few inches of snow and, uh, well, he was drunk, but, uh, I helped him up. And he couldn't really walk too well, so I I walked him to his house, which was about uh, I don't know maybe 600 meters, 0.6 kilometers away. Um, and uh, got his name, and he got my name, and uh, his name's Jason. So um, you know you can pray for him. He I, I don't know how receptive he'll be to anything once he sobers up but he seemed receptive to the things I said to him while he was drunk, which is kind of typical, but uh, he still needs our prayer. And it was kind of nice for me because it was, you know, I'm not saying, you know, nice for me that I helped somebody who was in trouble, but I'm just saying it shows me that God, God, that there's lots of people out there that God can direct us to, uh, to minister to. And um, so we need to be able to go, uh, wherever God leads us. And so for me, that was nice. It was comforting knowing that God can lead me to make a decision that's going to help somebody in need. And um, so, you know, all of us need to be aware of God's voice when he leads us uh, in ways that, you know, sometimes to make decisions that don't, don't really make sense or just are unusual. Sometimes God has uh, a divine appointment for us. So anyway, um, that's just, I guess, what the missionary report. Uh, um, now, here we're looking at a chart that I was just starting to put together. So Iran mentioned um, that there is uh, that if you have 187 weeks, it's going to be 1,309 days. Now, I had addressed 186 weeks before in the lines. Um, but and, and I had addressed 187 weeks, but I'd forgotten about it, where I had placed it. And and it's just simply if we go to um, I'll show you these dates here. Um, so yeah, here, July 18, 2020. So this I I'd, I'd written an email to Jeff back in October of 2019. Uh, so the date would have been. October 6, 2019, I wrote him, um, well, it wasn't just Jeff, but I mean, it was addressed to Jeff, but I sent it to Odilio and Stephen uh, as well. And Odilio said it's amazing, right? Um, and, uh, but I think we kind of forgot about it. Because um, later on, we dealt with part of this, but we never put it all together. So I'm just going to, uh, put this in here. So this is one one three zero nine days or 187 weeks. 
So that's going to be from this date here. Now, not everybody knows what this date is here, December 17th, 2016. This is the date, um, and Odilio and um, some others, uh, they had uh, brought this date up to me. It wasn't something that I knew knew about. But this was when Jeff was in Wales, and Chawatu does a presentation regarding Raffia. So that's going to be December 17th. And then it's going to be four weeks later that um, on January 14th, 2017. So I don't know, maybe I could use this here, put it here. So this is going to be, uh, I'll call it Raffia in Wales. Can people see that? Maybe I should make this a little bit bigger. And then we're going to have, um, and this is going to be Paneum. Now, Jeff, of course, is going to present Raffia as well. But this is when he's actually going to present um, the pandemic, right? So this is going to be January 14th, 2017. And then I just need another one of these. Okay, so um, the number of weeks, so I'm just, you know, dealing with these number of weeks here. We got June 27th, 2020. Trying to remember all this here. I got to put these dates in a, in something. So we got the four weeks uh, from this January fourteenth. Okay, that's what I have here. So now I remember what I'm doing. Um, and this is going to be March twenty seventh, twenty twenty one. Uh, we're going to have to have a few of these here. So we got four weeks, and this is going to be. So this is going to be three weeks in here, and then uh, this is going to be 39 weeks, 36 weeks, pardon me, 39 altogether. And um, I think this is correct. Okay. So how many weeks are in between here? So you got 187 minus 39 minus 4. So this is, if I'm making a mistake, please correct me. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, and then, so there was some other things in here. I don't know why I did that. I'd made some mistakes, I think, here. I could put another date in here, which is, I need to do this in this calendar converter thing. So anyway, any, any comments about this so far? Anything? So we're going to have from, from July 18 to March 27th. So I'm just going to save. And then minus... No, that's not right. So there, there, I know I made a mistake here. So you guys should be able to correct me here. So this should be not 36 weeks, but 33 weeks here. Right? There we go. So this is 147 weeks. That's what I had before. Okay. Does that make sense now? Looks good. Okay. So if people can add. So 147 weeks, that's um, 49 times three weeks. And then we have in in this line here we had this where you're going to have to June 27th. This was um, and 1260 days is how many weeks? One two six. 180. 180 weeks. Uh, right. Right. So it's going to be uh, 42 months as well, but it's 100 180 weeks. So if we put the weeks in there. And then you can see the 187 weeks here, the three weeks on this side, the four weeks on that side. That makes sense. So, so this number of weeks, 147, is so that's seven times seven times seven times three, right? Or is that just seven times seven times seven? Yeah, 49. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, so it's it's seven times seven times seven, which is three, right? So it's seven cubed. So does that make sense to people? No, it's not seven times seven times seven. It's seven times seven times three. There we go. Seven times seven is 49 times three. There we go. That's better. And then you get four weeks here, that there, that there. And this here. Now, we marked June 27th, so this was this 126 days. Um, but then we have another period of time here from June 27th to March 27th is 
273 days. Maybe I should have saved this for the symbolic use of numbers, but I got other stuff planned for that study. Okay, so, so this is going to be 273 days. And then this period of time that we had before, if you add these together, 1260 plus 273, you get 1,533 days. And then uh, July 18 to March 27, we know that that's, again, 36 weeks. I might as well put that in there. Okay. Do this differently. And any comments about this? I mean, why are we noticing this now? Is this important at this time? No comments? I mean, this this is old stuff. It's just that, you know, we're looking at it. Uh, I don't know why the 187 weeks there wasn't really talked about other than the one email that I know of. So there's that. Now, then we have another comment from Stephen regarding Daniel 11, verse 24. So we might as well look at it now even though it's it's going to be later in our study next week that we'll probably come back to this. So, Stephen, can you explain again what, what it was you saw in Joel that connects to Daniel 11, verse 24? Well, if you compare Daniel 11, 24 with Joel 1, verse yeah. 2, okay. you have sort of the language is the sort of same idea, almost. Yeah. So in Daniel 11, 24, it says he shall enter peaceably even upon the fattest places of the province. And he shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers. He shall scatter among the prey, the spoil, the riches. Yea, he shall forecast devices against his against the strongholds, even for a time. So this is Rome. Right now, uh, there is a comparison with Rome and Joel. Right. So we go Daniel 11, 24, and Joel. Yeah. Yeah, but Rome is here. And we have in and in Joel chapter one. chapter one. First page. Yeah. Hear this, ye old men, and give ear all ye inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days or even in the days of your fathers? Tell your children of it, and let your children tell their children and their children another generation, right? So uh, there was a controversy in the movement regarding Joel back in um, when, when I came into the movement in 2010. And this, this sort of intensified and led to a division where all these ministries, you know, Path of the Just, et cetera, um, left the movement. Right. So, so 2014. And it's going to be over the book of Joel. Obviously, that's not really all that it's about. But. But that's going to be the the contentious issue of why they're going to take these positions against Jeff. And Jeff applies this to Rome, correct? These different generations. Something to do with Rome. And I'm not sure if I fully understood the whole uh, study. We've gone through it. But um, they tried to apply these to Islam. So they're just saying, well, these palmer worm, the locust, the canker worm, the caterpillar, these are all uh, connected with uh, Islam in some way, right? And Jeff disagreed with that. But um, so if we're going to be talking about uh, the comparison here. So one of the things we know is that this is in 721 B.C., right? And why do we place it in 721 B.C., the book of Joel? Well, the Great Controversy, page 308, paragraph 1, talks about 2,500 years since yeah. the Dark Day, and you just count them back from the Dark Day in 1780. It takes yeah. you to 721. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and it's one way that you can sort of see the 2520. She, she there mentions 2,500, but you can see the 2,520 for Israel. Um is 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 connected, right? Because you're going to have the two extra years from the captivity of Hoshea to the writing of the book of Joel. And then you have another 18 years from 1780 to 
and the Pope being taken captive. So it's just another way to see uh, the 2520 um, in connection with, with, with the Bible. So um, now if we, we go back then, if we're going to take this verse and we're going to connect it to uh, the fall of Samaria, and why is this, I mean, that's, this is going into the book of Joel, but why, wh- how are we taking this, this phrase then? Uh, you know, it hasn't been in your days or even the days of your fathers, right? That's basically the idea. Now this is, I hear this, ye old men, all ye inhabitants of the land, hath this been in your days or even in the days of your fathers? So this would be, you know, I don't know. How, how would you explain it in, in its connection with Daniel chapter 11, verse 24? I mean, we have the same phrase. We have connecting back to the fall of Samaria, so which is going to be typical of what happens to Rome. So what is this? How are you applying this then here? Can you explain it? Or, or are you just looking at just it has the same phrase or same idea? <laughs> Well, it is slightly different. It talks about what your fathers have not done or whatever. Yeah. So it's not exactly the same, but quite similar. Yeah, one is what you haven't seen this in in that time. This is not done in that time. But this is talking about Rome, of what Rome's going to, uh, yes. what Rome is going to do. And And there are some similarities between that story and what's in Joel. Though that's going to be uh, dealing with northern Israel, right? Yes. So okay. the the argument is that Uriah Smith talked about this here. Fathers have not done that. This is relating to agreements that Rome was making with other nations, kings that they were sort of giving them their land. Yeah. To Rome, the Swearingen was saying. This is the destruction of the temple of Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. And to me, that's what the Joel is saying. He's relating to the destruction of Samaria. Mm-hmm. And yeah. sort of similar language here is this talking about the destruction of Rome. Or sorry, of, of Jerusalem and the temple. So I think to me, it's just maybe would uh, support Swearingen's argument. That this is uh, that he yeah. would be correct in his own, in his uh, interpretation. Yeah, yeah, and 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 of course, when we looked at the Hebrew, if you're going to translate this, it's not he shall scatter among them the prey. It's actually, um, you know, he shall scatter uh, um, the prey of them. Right is really what it says the prey of them, the spoil and the riches, right? So this is, is just saying that he's going to scatter them, right? Not scatter among them, not share um, the, the spoil and the riches and the prey. And, and so, so then we have, and he shall forecast his devices against the strongholds even for a time. Of course, that is, is, you know, in a sense, not necessarily connected to that. It's not like that. It's from when they scatter that. Uh, it's just giving that that whole period of time in which Rome is going to be um, uh, working from Rome, and then it moves to Constantinople, right? But we have two different um, two different interpretations of this that gives us two different periods of 360. Now, the other interesting idea then is in Joel, it's connecting us to the 2520, right? With that. With what Ellen White has done in a Great Controversy 308, Paragraph 1. So it's, it's a way of looking at the 2520, a time period. And is there any relationship between the 2520 and 360? And we, we would have to say yes, right? Because the 2520 is seven times 360. Agreed. Yeah. So, so there is some very strong evidence for how we had interpreted uh, this verse, and it's something we got to keep in mind as we start looking at at this this whole structure of these things. So, with um, 
I'm just thinking a little bit, some doing some math here, but we'll look at this later on when we when we get to those verses again and start drawing them on a line. So any any more thoughts on that before we move back to where we were in dealing with the diagrams of the line? So again, here's what we had been working on, um, these the six Syrian wars and its parallel to our history. When we look at how we had interpreted these verses, there's actually a lot more detail in the verses, in the applications that we have made, than we see on the line on the bottom, right? So the line on the top, the six Syrian wars, that works fine. Now we know we got, uh, you know, I put there the Battle of Pydna just as, as, as a date, but really it's going to be, what was that event called again? I have to look it up again. Uh, it's got a strange name. Yeah, at Julius, right? So they call it uh, the Day of Julius. U- 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 Ulysses, the Day of Ulysses, I guess it is. So what happens on the Day of Ulysses? The El- Eleusis, I don't know how you pronounce it. Sometimes it's like Greek to me. Anybody? Nobody wants to describe what happened that day? Why, why would it be significant? Do you want me just to read it? I'm not recalling the discussion on that point. Okay, so we had, uh, um, this is Rome in connection with, uh, so I'm just going to read here. In Antiochus's absence, so this is in uh, in the Sixth War, right? So it says here, in Antiochus's absence, Ptolemy VI and his brother Ptolemy Fiscon were reconciled, possibly after a brief civil structure, structure, struggle, Antiochus or Antiochus, Angered at the loss of control over the king, invaded again in 168 BC. The Egyptians sent to Rome asking for help, and the Senate dispatched Gaius Pompilius Linnaeus to Alexandria. Meanwhile, a Seleuc- Seleucid fleet seized Cyprus, and Antiochus's army took Memphis again. While at Memphis, he even issued an official decree as Egyptian king. The Ptolemaic armies failed to offer any major field battles instead of staying fortified in garrisons. Um, Antiochus was now prepared to march on the capital of Alexandria again at Eleusis. At the outskirts of Alexandria, he met Pompilus Linnaeus, with whom he had been friends during his stay in Rome. But instead of a friendly welcome, Pompilus offered the king an ultimatum from the Roman Senate. He must evacuate Egypt and Cyprus immediately. Rome had only just recently defeated the Macedonians at the Battle of Pydna, potentially freeing up armies with which it could credibly threaten the Seleucids. Antiochus begged to have time to consider, but Pompilius drew a circle around him in the sand with his cane and told him to decide before he stepped outside it. Antiochus chose to obey the Roman ultimatum to avoid a new Roman Seleucid war, a retreat that Polybius described as personally humiliating for Antiochus. The day of Ulysses ended the Sixth Syrian War and Antiochus's hopes of conquering Egyptian territory. Still, the Ptolemies were greatly weakened by the war as well as the conflict between the Ptolemy VI and, and VIII. The rebel named Dionysus Petrosarapus would attempt to exploit the animosity between the two Ptolemy brothers can start a series of revolts from 168 to 164. So you know, I have the Battle of Pydna there. I, I like the date, but this is going to be after the Battle of Pydna. So this day of Ulysses, is it significant? Would we say it's symbol? Is it symbolically important? It should be. Okay. And so we're going to have this here, the day of Ulysses, just underneath this. I just, I like the Pidna date just because of its the structure here. It gives us a specific date. I don't know if we have a date for the day of Ulysses. Um, but uh, you, you, Eleusis, I don't know how you say it. Anyway, I could look it up. So, so this is going to, um, so, so what's the symbolism there? 
So you got Rome with Egypt, right? The, the king of the south. This is this is you know these other Syrian wars are connected here. This is part of the Syrian war, the sixth Syrian war. And we have it at the way mark as the third angel arrives. Right? It's going to be the end now. No, technically it's not the end of Greece, but it's it's Rome entering into uh, this history in a way that em- demonstrates its power, right? I mean, obviously, in, in the end, you're going to still have the Battle of um, Actium, right, which we mark uh, Rome conquering Greece. So, what is Rome doing here, and how does the, how does this symbol relate to that way mark of that we call the Sunday Law way mark. Another way to, to look at this: remember, Greece represents the United Nations, right? Spiritualism, atheism, communism, all those types of things, right? It's humanism, secularism, and at the Sunday Law is is the secular humanistic world. Is Greece going to be complicit with the Sunday Law? I would think that it would have to be. Okay. So so they would they would have to be complicit. Now they're complicit. Now, are they doing this because they believe in it? No. No. Right. And wouldn't this symbolize what happens here with with Greece submission to Rome? It it's more out of expediency than you know, out of a, a basic uh, belief. It's it's a type of self preservation, I guess. Right. Agreed. OK. So so this is illustrating the role of these different powers in, in Daniel chapter 11. So remember, um, Medo-Persia represents who? In, in when we go to Daniel chapter 11, the kings of Medo-Persia, who do they represent? Primarily the Republicans. Well, they represent the United States. I mean, obviously, it, it, the presidents of the United States aren't all Republican. So Medo Persia is this two horn power, which is from Revelation 13. That's why we, we take Medo Persia, it's two horn power, we, we match it up with the United States. So Medo Persia represents the false prophet. Greece represents who? The dragon power, right? Dragon power, okay. Right? And Rome represents. The beast, right? The dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. That's the threefold union. And so here in Daniel chapter 11, we're looking at each of these three parts of what in Revelation is going to be Babylon. The dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. The city of Babylon that has these three parts. Does that make sense? It's got a logical application. Okay. Now, so Babylon's the nation that, that's there before. Now, remember, Medo-Persia conquers Babylon, right? Greece is going to conquer Medo-Persia, but also Babylon. And Greece is going to conquer, or, or Rome's going to conquer Greece, which, which is also going to include Babylon. It's, but Rome is the beast power in Revelation. But all of these together are Babylon. So, so we can see what Daniel chapter 11 is trying to do. When we put it into our time, look at the application of it. It's describing these, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Not in that order, but it's describing these powers and the role that they have. And all of them ultimately end up being overtaken by Rome. That's why Rome has to exalt itself to establish the vision. Now, so that makes sense. The line on the top makes sense. That's going to be the end of Greece in in that sense. Rome now comes in. But then you're going to have uh, our line. And in this line, it's it's a lot more complicated in the sense that uh, we've looked at detail in this line. Um, but we have a lot of this is still future. That is. And, and then we're looking at this line almost as a zoom into another line. And the question is, should we have done that? Is there an application of this line underneath here that that doesn't have like these future dates that were because here January 6, 2021, we're saying is raffia on this line. 
right? It's the, it's the midnight. But we know we haven't reached midnight on, if we're going to look at the line above, have we reached midnight in that line above? And we would have to say, well, if raffia is this raffia that's midnight, well, that's still future, right? So we've chosen to look at um, uh, 9-11 and 11-9 together here in this law. So <clears throat> what should we do about this? Is this line um, really two different lines mixed together? Or, are we? Because remember, we did that in um, Judges. We went through Judges, and we had you know a line of the Judges. And then we could, um, even within some of those those uh, lines, we had a way mark where we could create a line. And maybe maybe this looking at this as eleven nine is, you know, we're zooming into that second angel arriving in in our interpretation in the present truth application of of this part of Daniel chapter eleven. And that we we probably could have zoomed out. We could have taken the pandemic out of there. We could take January sixth out of there, and and just put some other way marks. That you know we got midnight. That's something we're approaching. We don't know what when it is, but here we put midnight because Rafi is midnight. January sixth, twenty twenty one is midnight. Within our lines, we can see this history, but it it must be a zooming into nine eleven. That is. 11.9 relates to the pandemic. And so that's a zoom into 9.11, right? That's where this movement has started to look at what was happening immediately and thinking we were on the big line. But we're, we're, and when I say the big line, like Jeff's line, right? 9.11, midnight, midnight, cry, Sunday law. And, but we're not to midnight. So what do we do about it? Because if we're going to start creating a more complex line, like we have in our interpretation, that we do have some some applications already, where we, um, you know, we looked at these different spans of times and these different symbols, and we fixed them in, with dates dealing with, uh, you know, Biden and Trump, etc. Right. But here in this line that we have on the bottom, you know, we got Biden in there, we have the pandemic in there. But we have these other dates off in the future, so and we don't know what they they mean. Um, having April fifth, twenty thirty, as a symbol of, in this case, the midnight cry. You know, it's the first day of the first month, and October eighth is twenty twenty or twenty thirty is the tenth day of the seventh month. So, any ideas of what we do with this? Because we have a lot of detail here that we don't have in that line. And that detail is more immediate in our history than these future dates. Right. So we don't get to, to April 5th, 2030 till Daniel 11 verse 15. And so a lot of this stuff that we have here, we would have to, I don't know, I don't know what we would do. I mean, we'd have to have another line. Within that line, we'd have to zoom into a way mark. That is, what we see here in Daniel chapter 11 in these verses, we can put them on, on this bigger line of these six Syrian wars. And, and we have the Battle of Raphia here. And here, the Battle of Raphia, well, we would say that's midnight. And we're saying, well, that's going to be, in this interpretation, we're putting it more in the future, right? Yet we have some stuff earlier that we're putting in the present. And so how do we resolve that problem? You know, so, so we have this line here and this is going to be, you know, this is the line dealing with um, uh, the divisions of what happens, the divisions of, of Alexander's kingdom, but it's not going to address the end of Alexander's kingdom, right? This, this diagram here, it's just the scattering of of the kingdom to the four winds of heaven. And, and this line is going to go all the way up to uh, Inauguration Day in 2025, so a year from now, and a bit, or less, less than a year from now. Okay? So you guys have to tell me what to do. <laughs> How are we going to approach this? Are we going to 
try to create some more lines here? Are we going to leave this? Because what we can do is we can start drawing the lines. We can start studying uh, how this these lines of Rome, because Rome's going to begin um, in this in this history at the end of Greece, right? So we go back to verse 14. And we make new applications and we start addressing Rome itself. Now, one of the whole reasons we started studying uh, Daniel chapter 11 had to do with, of course, um, uh, the kings of Persia, right? That was where we started and that was relating to Revelation chapter 17. But then when we started looking at these battles between the king of the north and the king of the south, these become extremely important in understanding the conflicts that are going on presently within the United States. That is, the United States was conquered by the globalists. And so, you know, that's going to be Raffia. And then Paneum has to happen. So the globalists need to be defeated within the United States. And, and we don't know when that is. And we don't know if we take... Uh, January 6, 2021 as Raffia. I mean, it's obviously not the Raffia on the, on the other line because it's midnight and we're not to midnight yet. So it's something typical, right? It's a type of what's going to happen, but it, it fits within our line. Our line is this zoomed in, uh, way mark to the, to 9-11. So we're still dealing with 9-11. We're still in the history of 9-11, but 9-11 on the bigger line, is is a zoom into on Ellen White's line. It's a zoom into the Sunday Law, right? But 9/11 is the start of the Sunday Law history. But the Sunday Law doesn't happen at 9/11 in the literal sense. There's a lot of things that happen. You know, we move from common law to Roman law with the Patriot Act, things like that. <clears throat> so my suggestion is, and you guys, you have to tell me if you want to do that or not. Is that we just start drawing this line of Rome. And that might help us a little bit when we go back and look at, at these verses again. So this line of Rome, we're taking the last part of that history of Greece and we're going to use this. That is, we're going to have a parallel between the fifth Syrian war and the Soviet Afghan war, where we had already made an alignment between the Soviet Afghan war. And um, the uh, basically Alexander's history. Um, so Alexander's war with Persia. Now we know symbols can have more than one meaning, and and we're making an application here. So there's there's the application of Daniel, which we're understanding, you know, historically. But we can make different applications. This isn't the only way that we can compare Daniel to our history. So what are we going to do? Are we going to start drawing the line of Rome? Are we going to start going through this and putting this on the line? Right? Because we, we've gone through this already. We've done some of this on lines uh, in, a, in a way, just not completed. And then we're going to end up with the papacy. So it's going to be the, you know, the, you know, there's parallels between Rome and the papacy, and then we're going to finally get into what happens here with uh, the rise of the papacy. So we're going to have a line for the papacy as well. Now, I mean, we, we have so many different lines, so much repeat and enlarge. Sometimes it gets a little bit confusing, but I don't know. So is anybody going to say anything about this, what we should do? Because we got about a half an hour left today. And, you know, we could go through this. We don't necessarily need to start drawing this out. Or we could go back and try to look more at the end of that other line that we were drawing. Discuss that more. What do you guys want to do? Go back to the other line for a minute, please. Okay. 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 Now, is there anything significant? that we see between the Battle of Raffia and Pydna? Well, I mean, they both have the same date, right, and obviously. 49 years apart. And they're 49 years apart, yeah. 
Now, in looking at this, both of these battles take place on the 13th day of the third month in their respective biblical years. And you have, if I've done my math right, 1,700 or 17,897 days between them. And that's just taking the Julian dates and subtracting them. Okay, so so I'm just going to put this here. So how many days did you have? 17,897. Yeah, that's the cardinal count between them. So you have in 178, you have the numbers of July 18th, just in a different order. Yes. Now, if we took 49 years and you did it in, because we, we dealt with this when we were looking at um, the 490 years, the 70 weeks. Okay. So, you know, 49 uh, times 360 is going to give you 17640. So remember, that is is simply uh, 20. Uh, I guess it's what, uh, 25, 20 times seven, right? Now we have this extra number of days just to, because it's matching a solar year, not a, a prophetic year. And that's going to give us this 17,897. So the difference there is 257 days between 49 prophetic years and 49 Julian years. Right. Okay. <clears throat> Um, so just as a symbol, it does give us the 17640. So it relates to, uh, 49 years obviously relates to the 490 years. It also relates to, uh, the 1764 years from 34 AD to 1798. And also going back from 34 AD to Jacob blessing his 12 sons, right? In, Seven, um, 1731 BC. So, um, so the question is, is what's, what's the symbol here? Right. How do we, how do we address this? Well, one is, um, you know, 168 is also a symbol of the number of hours in a week, right? Okay. So we have the number of hours in a week is 168. It's related to the Hebrew number for home. It's 168, I believe. Um, so that, so that symbol has shown up a lot. It also has the digits for the 186 cardinal days from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month. And then of course we have 217 for Raphael, which is, uh, you know, that's going to be uh, 31 times seven. So, I mean, I've tried to figure out the Battle of Hidna as far as what exactly does it mean. And, and, and I put it there because, you know, it has the same date. So it's this June 22nd. That's a symbol of FFA. <clears throat> okay. So, I mean, you know, in trying to relate this to, to our history, I mean, there, there could be multiple ways that we could take this line. And make applications to our time. Um, and, th- and that's part of the problem with this line below is that this line below is just, well, it's dealing with stuff way off in the future. And the question is, should we actually be bringing dates in there that are going to be um, more directly related to what's been happening in the movement? Because that's how we and, and what's happening in the United States because that's how we looked at the verses themselves. And then I just drew this line and said, well, no, this is um, something. So I'm not really satisfied with this line on the bottom, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, because we have symbols there that don't really match with the symbols on the bottom, on, on the right side of this line. But I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm putting symbolic dates there. That is, I'm saying April 5th, 2030 is a symbolic date of something that's going to happen, which we would call Pania. And October 8th, 2030 is a symbolic date of the Sunday law. 
And so in this line, we, we've already passed midnight, because J- if January 6th is Raffia, then, then we've passed midnight in this line. But I'm not saying because I put April 5th, 2030 and October 8th, 2030 on this line that I'm saying, you know, that those dates are when, you know, Paneum and the Sunday law are going to happen, right? I'm not saying that. I'm just saying they're symbolic dates that, that witness to our line. So it's symbolizing something that's going to be happening maybe in our history. And October 8th is symbolizing something that's going to happen in our history. They're not going to be the actual Sunday law. It's not going to be the actual midnight cry that, that we see in the line above. But I, I don't really know what to do about the future. I mean, we also have dates that we could put in this line that that have happened, you know, within history and within this movement after January 6th. I mean, instead of having October 8th, you know, we could have some some other date that's passed already. Instead of April 5th, we could have some other date. So I, I don't I don't know the answer to that. But but you can see what I'm saying about if we put Pidna there and June 22nd and 168, and, and you know, this obviously obviously can relate to our movement. Now what about you know what about the role of Rome, you know, on the day of Eleusis? Eleusis. Has that happened? Yet, or what would it re- what would it represent? We say, well, it represents the Sunday law, but can it represent something that has happened within this movement? I believe that we're looking into something right now that that we're all going to have to be considering because I don't know how that's going to apply yet within the movement. When I'm looking at studies that we've done in the past, mm-hmm. we just looked at this. In our, in this conversation, mm-hmm. between Raffia and Pidna, we have 1,007 or 17,897 days because it's a 49 year period. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Now, when during the camp meeting, one of the other items that, that I had looked at when we were looking at the third decree and the 490 years of that were accounted unto his people, unto Daniel's people. We have that period of 1,000 of 17,897 days between the third decree in 457 and the streets and walls in troublous times. Yes. Okay, so here, let's, let's go, um, I'll just go back to some other charts. Okay, so, so here is a chart which we looked at before when we were dealing with the 70 weeks. A sort of detailed analysis of these spans of the time. And so see this at the top, 178969 days? Right. That relates to your 17897, right? It's just, this is more precise because this is 490 years. And that would be uh, a prophetic uh, uh, 490 years plus this 259, 2569 days. Now, of course, as an inclusive count, it'd be uh, 2520 plus 50 days. But as a cardinal count, it's 2520 plus 49 days. Right. So you can see that that. What, what you have here is you have this symbol of the 2520 connected to the week of Christ. And then you have, um, the actual, uh, um, you know, the, the number of, of actual days. I don't know how to explain that. So like in, in this too, we also have the 62 weeks, right? And so right. remember the center of the 62 weeks is 191. BC, the Battle of Thermopylae with Rome, and then you have uh, 217 years on either side going back to the 49. So, so obviously these symbols are all tied to the 70 weeks. Exactly. Right. Um, I know this is a really complicated chart, and 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 one of the things that happens is if we count from the 10th day of the seventh month in 457 BC, and you count 
490 prophetic years, it's going to bring you to October 13th, 27 AD, which is 13 days past uh, when the 70th week actually begins, right? So there's this symbol of this 13. And one of the things I, I sort of hemmed and hawed about was you have the 70th week, and we just say, well, Jesus is baptized on the 10th day of the seventh month in 27 AD, because that's the beginning of the 70th week. And as the Messiah, he, you know, he's baptized, right? That starts the whole thing of the, mess- the Messianic week. But, you know, it, it is possible that he's baptized like 13 days later, that he's not baptized on September 30th. It makes the start of the week, but there's going to be this 13 years or 13 days um, as a symbol. And that would make October 13th, which is already a symbol in our time, as a significant date. But I still am sticking to September 30th, 27 AD as the baptism. Okay, just, you know, I've hemmed and hawed about it. And then you have this one week. And, you know, we know it's it's 2520 plus the 49 days, if we have literal days for that week. And, and so we've gone through these studies before. Um, and then you're going to have uh, the 36 years I got here on this side. What is this here? It's going to be to the destruction of Jerusalem here. You know, 13,083 days after the stoning of Stephen, you're going to have the destruction of Jerusalem. So I just have a lot of this detail. And then I, I go from... Um, can't remember what the February 23rd, 33 AD is. Not sure what I did here on the bottom. I'm just dividing that period of time from, uh, it must have been something about February 23rd. Anyway, ignore that for now because I'm not sure what that is. But, but, but the, so getting back to this other chart then. So when we go back here and we look at the Battle of Pydna, we can see that there is this span of time, which I'm, I'm going to put in here. Just um, this way, 490, 49 years. And, and this obviously relates to the 49 years um, at the beginning. So if we were to go from, well, let's do it this way. So if we go from 457, so we're going to go from, okay, we'll do it. I'll, I'll show you what I'm doing here. It's just. Okay, so we got um, 457 BC. We're going to go to October uh, 29th. That's going to be the 10th day of the seventh month on the Julian. It's going to be October 29th. Let me just clear this up. Um, and, and then we're going to go 49 years later. So that's going to be 178. Nine seven, right? Is that what you mm-hmm. had? Yep. Okay, so that's going to bring us to well, that one's going to be one day less to get to the tenth day of the seventh month. I'll, I'll do it that way. So that's four oh eight. That's just going to end um, the forty nine years. And now we want to go to uh, two seventeen. That's going to be June twenty second, and then we go. Now, both of these have that 13th day of the third month, which you know, right? Is, right? Which, right. which I'm not sure what, what that particularly means. We do have 313 as a symbol that shows up again and again in our lines. But if you, if you take a look at the rabbinic date here as well, you're dealing with the 14th day of the fourth month, which is 144. Yeah. So anyway, when we put these on a chart here, uh, what we see is we got these uh, spans of time. These ones are almost the same. This is one day less. So that would be an inclusive count of 17,897 days. This is just a cardinal count of 17,897 days. And then between them is uh, this period of six six nine six three five days. So that's going to be. 190 years to be precise and um, 
about you know, 237 and a half days. I mean, if we're going to 237, that's the 273 symbols. Um, but it's all, it's, it's really, uh, it's 191 years is another way of looking at it, right? Correct. So, so that means, yeah. Yeah. So why is that? Why do we get that 191 years? Because we already have 191 years as the center of the 62 weeks, 191 BC with the 217. So that just kind of gives us more emphasis on that symbol of the middle of the 62 weeks. So, okay, here's just the thought. So we got the 62 weeks and, and I've, I've addressed the idea that the 62 weeks are, so the 62 weeks themselves, the midst of the week in the week of Christ is you're taking 31 AD and dividing the week with 31 AD, right? And so 31 times 7 is 217. The, right. six, the 62 weeks are divided into two periods of 217 years. Yes. Right. Or really two periods of 31 times seven years, right? Because 217 is 31 times seven. So, so this is something I noticed quite a long time ago, 2015, I think is when I was first addressing that, um, understanding, uh, the relationship between the week of Christ and the 62 weeks. So the 62 weeks is obviously two periods of 31 weeks. So the 31 weeks relates to 31 AD. So it's just more evidence that Jesus needs to be crucified in 31 AD. And, and it, it adds to that symbol of 31 AD, just like 70 AD is a symbol. You know, 31 AD is, is obviously symbolized in the 62 weeks. So the 62 weeks relate to that. So we now have more connections. We have, we have raffia and then we have Pidna, right? Um, so that's going to give us this 49 years. And that's, that's going to remind us of the 49 years at the beginning of the 70 weeks. And then, so between these two periods of 49 years, there's 191 years. Well, it's really, you know, 190 years and 237 days. But it still has 191 years. And that 191 years is a symbol of, of the center of the 62 weeks, right? So it just, it just keeps strengthening these lines by binding them together. But, but the question is, what is it specifically trying to tell us as far as our understanding of these, these passages? <clears throat> and I would say that it shows us that it relates specifically to our history that there is something about our history that relates to the week of Christ, which which we have already partly understood. Partly understood, I think, is the operative term. Mm -hmm. Because <clears throat> there's quite a bit that we're looking at here within this portion with the six Syrian wars, mm -hmm. as far as the time frame that ties directly in with what we've been dealing with within the week of Christ. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, the way that we were understanding the week of Christ as it related to our movement, I mean, we, we obviously had, had placed this date, the first day of the first month, right? That gave us April 5th, 2030. So one of the things, you know, I'm not really satisfied here. And I'm just going to do this, you know, so, because I still think April 5th, 2030, in our line, in relation to this, is this symbol that um, addresses the, the three angels' message arriving. That is, there's something that happens in our movement. And I'm not saying it's on April 5th, 2030. I'm just saying it symbolizes that. Because we have the first day of the first month in 1844. And it's 2300 lunar months to April 5th, 2030. It's also, um, you know, connected to 9-11. 
which is also a symbol of the first day of the first month. Right? So we have we, we go to the story of of Ezra seven uh, to ten. Right, we end up having all of these symbols that relate to this history, and so we've done this already in the past. So we have an April fifth, twenty thirty, as this symbolic day, which is really the third angel arriving. But here, it's the first day of the first month. You know, it's not the tenth day of the seventh month as the Sunday law symbol. But within our movement, that's that's what ends up happening. Another way to look at it is in Millerite history, they have the first day of the first month. That's going to be the second angel arriving. And then they have the third angel arriving on the 10th day, the seventh month, right? Marking the end of the 2300 years. But because we have these 2300 months to April 5th, 2030, and all these other witnesses, you know, it's going to be 186. Uh, it's going to be the start of the 187th year. Right. From April 19th, 1844. Right. There's 186 years. And then the first day of the first month, that's going to be the 187th. Because April 5th, 2030 is the first day of the first month. So so that symbol of 2300 and the 187 are connected in in that. But in Millerite history, they end on the 10th day of the seventh month. But if we look in the story of Ezra, it brings us from the first day of the first month to the first day of the first month. And that means the first day of the first month in 2030, we could actually connect that back to 9-11, which is also the first day of the first month as a symbol in the lines that Jeff has. So, so I think that that needs to be there, that we, that in this repeat of history, we, we come to 2030 and I'm not saying that anything happens on a specific date, but God has given us this additional extension of time to file our taxes, so to speak, from the tax form 2688. We had all these symbols dealing with that. Um, and we had, you know, Ezra 7 to 10, all giving us these witnesses that this movement has a work to do. And we have a time limit set symbolically. It means we have we have time and we, we can get that done sooner. Right. But but there comes a time when time runs out. Yep. Right. But is this movement has to get its act together now. Now, obviously, there's more than just this movement as far as what God is doing on this earth. Uh, it would be pretty presumptuous of, of, of us to believe that God is only leading this small little group. Even in the time of Christ, there was there was other people doing the work in other parts of the world and in other parts of the kingdom that weren't necessarily aware of what was happening in Jerusalem. Right? Do we agree with that? Yeah. So so God is working upon the earth. And and at some point he's going to take this work into his own hands. I mean he has in a sense. But all of these different parts that are unaware of each other but are connected with Christ will be working together towards this goal. So we don't need an organization that's going to be in at the head of the work. We have Christ at the head of the work. And he is bringing us through experiences on a personal level within the movement itself that are meant to be uh, blessings to us to prepare us to teach us so that we can actually do uh, what he's asking us to do and you know and we we don't really know um, how bad we are right you know in in, in James chapter one uh, he says uh, my brethren counted all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Now, I mean, you could translate this a little bit differently because sometimes we think uh, temptations, you know, is like temptations to sin. But, you know, you could say, um, in, in just another translation says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, right? Now, why would we rejoice when we meet trials, all kinds of different trials? Is that is that a reason to have joy? Do we like trials? Yeah, right. You're kidding. No, we really don't like trials. 
we do everything we can to avoid trials. Yep. And, and it's not, you know, obviously we don't intentionally, because you fall into diverse trials, right? That means um, this is not something that we in, intentionally do. That that would be um, fall in the Greek means it's per, parapipto, parapipta, parapipto. Yeah, and it uh, means um, to fall into something that is all around. You know, so we're surrounded by these trials and, and we fall into them. They're not something that we intentionally go into this, right? But we need to count it all joy because we know that the trying of our faith worketh patience. But patience, but let patience have her perfect work that she may be perfect and entire. So the idea of per- perfect is teleos. It means complete, uh, coming to sort of the full age, right? And entire, uh, complete in every part that is perfectly sound. So this would be more uh, dealing with, you know, the idea of holistic, right? It, it actually is holoclerus, right? So to be perfectly sound in body, entire, whole, and and wanting or lacking nothing right yeah so not lacking no thing not anything so so if we look at at what these lines are about remember these lines are not just about a bunch of dates right these lines are not just about a bunch of figures uh, on on a chart they're actually about our experience these are about the trials the tests that god brings us through that we can develop a Christ-like character. And and those trials, you know, they happen on, on a local individual level, on, on within the movement, and, and on an international level, you know, prophetic level. So these are these are what we're going through. This is this is our experience. And so when we're studying these things and we're looking at Daniel chapter eleven, many people just look at it as past history. But if it's just past history, is it meaningful in the sense if we don't have an application to our time? It would just be a curiosity, right? If if we don't understand how the history in the past relates to the present, it's it's just a dead letter. Correct. Okay. So so we know that we need to understand this history because it's speaking to us presently and it's speaking to this movement presently and it's speaking to us as individuals. You know, and we all have trials. Now, I'm not saying that I always a joy in trials, but I'm always happy no matter what is happening. Because I understand from past experience that God's plans are better than my plans and that he can take care of things um, that that I can't know anything about. And so we always have to trust no matter what's happening, if the world's not turning out the way we want, if our daily life is not turning out the way that we want, we can rejoice in that because God has something better prepared for us than what we want for ourselves. Can we believe that? I would say yes. And that even the things that we want, that we think we want, sometimes those things are not bad. Uh, in and of themselves, but in order for those things to be, for us to be whole and complete and entire, and for the things that we, you know, we believe are godly to come to be, that we have to actually experience trials. And sometimes things have to be taken away from us before they can be given back to us whole. That is, we have messed things up. Right. And we give the things that we have messed up to God and he restores them. But sometimes in the middle of that, it's like a child, you know, having a a broken a toy. You know, he gives it to his dad. He doesn't know what his dad's going to do. Is he just going to throw it away? But then it comes back repaired. 
and, and better than it was before. That's how God is. He has these purposes and these plans. And I, and I think the problem with us is that we have, we have not trusted God to take care of things within the movement, within the world, but also in our personal everyday life. We, we try to manipulate things to fit our thinking and understanding. We think that we are God, that we know what is best. And do we know what is best? Never. No. God knows what's best. So to, to, to be able to just trust that God knows what's best, that's the relationship of a child with a father, a loving father who cares for us. And, and this is what we're studying. So we need to keep that in mind as we, we go through this. Anyway, let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for your goodness and love and for the trials that you give us and those around us. We just pray, Lord, that we can be faithful in the little things that you have given us to do, to minister to those in need and, and to realize the blessings that come with that. We're thankful for the things that we've been studying and we pray over the next couple of days as we study individually and we look into these things more deeply um, that you can guide us and bring us together again in the study on Sunday morning. We also pray for the study uh, tomorrow night and, and on Sabbath, the studies. And we just ask, Lord, that um, you can lead and guide that the blessings that you have prepared for us can be received by us. Be with each person, watch over them, and help them to cling to you in spite of what they see around them. Help each of us, Lord, um, as we study. And those online who are looking into these things, we pray that you, your Holy Spirit can speak to their hearts. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.